Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, Spirited Conversations with Interesting People. I am your host, Christopher Hart. This week, I, you know, I didn't even mention this last week. I, I, I may have mentioned it, but it was kind of fleeting. Last week was our one year anniversary. We've been doing this. This is episode 53, one per week. We are one year into this horrible, horrible show. <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much for sticking in for a full year. I feel like this should be a bigger deal, but in my mind, I guess I was thinking, I was thinking 100 was the big deal, right? We should, we should celebrate at 100, not at 52, which is kind of a weird number to begin with. Um, a couple things. So, yes, yeah, so happy anniversary to us. Happy one year anniversary to this, uh, this beautiful show. And to celebrate, we are doing our first barrel selection for the show. This uh, pinhook has developed a little bit of a, a little bit of a cult following over the last few years, depending on which market you're in. But Houston has loved pinhook. Uh, we I got with the co the, the founder Sean Josephs, and uh, when I found out that they were doing barrel selections for the year, they're doing 34 barrels. That's I think 15 bourbon and 20 rye barrels, single barrels for the nation, and we got the very first rye barrel ever on today's episode. I am joined by Daryl Bowman of Bad Wine Reviews. You can check his channel out at uh, badwinereviews.com and of course on YouTube, Bad Wine Reviews. He does a satire version of reviews uh, with various hosts. There's even a really bad episode of me on there somewhere. And uh, great guy. He's a good old boy. We kind of joke about that a little bit. I don't know if it's on air or off air, but um, I'm glad it's not on air actually now that I think about it. Um, <clears throat> Daryl Bowman of Bad Wine Reviews and Sean Josephs, the founder of Pinhook. So Sean lives in New, New Orleans. He flew in literally to come to today's show for us to select through his three favorite of the lot of barrels that he picked uh, for Pinhook. So we talk about the brand. We talk about where it comes from. And we taste through samples and pick one and maybe another one. We'll see. I got to bother him some more. Uh, this week's episode is sponsored by Highland Park and McAllen. As you guys know, Elise, the last week's episode was a lot of fun. I think we, just so you know, which she won't see this, we wanted to title it Who the is Sarah Troxel? And we, we couldn't get away with it. So we, we, we reduced that to Who is Sarah Troxel, who is incredibly sweet, incredibly kind. And uh, I adore her. We had a great episode, and this week's episode is also sponsored by E.P. Carrillo and Stogies of Houston. So if you're a cigar fan, go on down to Westheimer, the best humidor in the state. It is absolutely fantastic. Jorge, the owner, is loved by all. And we, this year, did a micro-batch blend of cigars with Room 101 Cigars for the Whiskey Social. We did a small run of 2,000 sticks, 210 packs, and it will be available starting at the Houston Whiskey Social this year until it's gone. 210 packs is not a lot. It'll go fast. And if you're a Room 101 fan, it they've got a little bit of a cult following. It's definitely a little bit of a collector's item, even if it tastes bad. <laughs> not that it's going to taste bad. I thoroughly enjoyed the cigar. They are currently resting right now in a humidor at 71% humidity, just a little wetter than, than normal. Um, I'm a huge, huge, not going to say it, um, avid enjoyer of cigars. Man, it's hard when you don't say what you normally say. All right, a couple things. Not, well, in a couple of weeks. So by the time you hear this, you might hear this just before the TJ Miller episode. We're going to be doing a special, that's right, you heard me. Who's TJ Miller? TJ Miller is the actor comedian. He was got a start in Cloverfield. He's in a bunch of kids' movies, uh, How to Train Your Dragon, uh, Big Hero 6, or Hero Big 6, or 666. And, uh, of course, from Silicon Valley. So TJ Miller will be in studio with Cash Levy. They have a podcast of their own called Cashing In with TJ Miller. It is a, uh, com a comedy. I've wanted to sit down with comedians since the show began. And this is the first of many, I promise you. Just to sit down and have discussions with celebrities who enjoy cigars or, or, or whiskey. And, and not just drinkers, but people who actually enjoy it. And that's what that episode's going to be about. So we'll be sitting down with TJ Miller in a couple of weeks. But for you, it'll I think it's next week. So he'll be in town 
uh, at the Houston Improv at February 23rd, 24th, sorry, March 23rd, 24th, and 25th. At the Houston Improv, tickets are 25 bucks. Go see a stand-up. Meet TJ Miller. I mean, it's pretty freaking cool. So I think that covers all of our homework. Sean's the founder of Pinhook, the master taster, and has a long history as a restaurateur and certified sommelier. So without further ado, Daryl Bowman, Sean Josephs of Pinhook. Cheers. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, it's great to be here. Can you Thank hear you. me? Yeah, we're all good. Daryl? Yeah. Let me go ahead and just get this out of the way. Save us some trouble. I can look at my notes without it. <clears throat> so, founder, co-founder, founder, what, what do you prefer? Yeah, so yeah. I'll, we'll say founder, but some other people <laughs> may disagree with co-founded you. Co-founded it with me, so. So, founder of Pinhook. Yeah. You guys have a little bit of a cult following, too. I mean, um, when I first found your brand a couple years ago, there's a guy locally named Sean Weisinger who kind of obsessed about you guys. Um, and, and now we actually, I found it when we were in Kentucky. Uh, you guys have only been in Texas for two years? Yeah, but I mean, not <laughs> barely even that. I'd say a little more than a year. Sure. Point. And uh, we we liked it. I mean, the rye, I think we enjoyed more than the bourbon just because rye is going through a little bit of a, a – a resurgence right now, I think. I think I think yeah. it's a little bit of a, an awakening. I mean, yeah, it's this it's the smaller category. Well, definitely right? nowadays, so it has, yeah, has room to grow. And I and I think to you know to your point, and that's why I guess we're we're tasting um, rye. I'm happy with our bourbon, but I'd say in general, it's just corn is a little more astringent and a little more awkward in its youth, and definitely starts to round out as it ages. Whereas I think with rye, you know, for me, I love this two year old rye. Um, so I think rye shows really well. Well, I haven't um, had it in quite some time, so let's taste. I, I brought multiple glasses, so we can kind of jump around. You got your right, core cool. glass there. <coughs> Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, guys. I, I might be a little heavy-handed on the pours. I apologize. <laughs> no, well, it's awful. It's a good way to get get around to the show. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers guys. Ding. Ding. Cheers. Ding. Daryl with a dirty glass. I'm gonna kill my weight. Yeah, my I'm my kind maid. Of a dirty guy, so that works. I've always been fascinated by rye, especially old rye. You know that um, America in general, for those who uh, are are not familiar, old old stuff, early 1900s yeah. rye was was where it was at. Uh, some old overholts from the, the, the pre-prohibition were pretty sick. So, And that's what this kind of like reminds me of. I, I never get pickles, though. I, people always say like with MGP stuff, you get yeah. dill. I mean, that's also just – I started in the wine business, and that's also just like a classic American oak kind of note. People will say dill. But, yeah, I agree with you. I don't know that that's anything that jumps out of me here. Well, <clears throat> well let's talk about that. So your, your background, uh, you're a sommelier, right? I and started, not a whiskey sommelier, not someone who no, bought never the certification. Got one of those. <laughs> never got one of those. I do have some wine certifications. Um, I got my uh, – I'm a certified sommelier through the Quartermaster Sommeliers. Um, I also have my certificate from the American Sommelier Association. But I kind of – it's a it's a long story, but I got into the restaurant business about 15 years ago. And uh, I was already – you know, I enjoyed whiskey. I kind of jumped on the wine um, – Train? Train, as it were. And did the whole thing and worked at some fancy restaurants in New York and, um, you know, really got into it. And uh, and then I'd always liked American whiskey and I just really got more and more into it. Um, and then when it really, I, I think, took a hard turn, I opened a, a restaurant in Brooklyn in 2008 called Char Number no. 4, which was really the first American whiskey bar and restaurant. I would say in the United States outside of Kentucky. Wow. It was very, it, it's hard for people to remember, I think, because it feels like this boom has been going on for a while. But 2008, right, is no one cared about Pappy, you know. So I was, uh, you know, I owned the restaurant, but I was doing all the, you know, the beverage program. I was ordering Hearst 16 from oh, my yeah. distributor every week vintage 17 year bourbon, vintage 23 year rye, sure. vintage 21 year rye. No one cared about Pappy, my other friends in the restaurant. Restaurants would give me their pappy at cost because they couldn't sell it. Um, you know, Elijah Craig 18 was $35 wholesale. Um, 
there was only one maker's mark. There was only one wood for, you know, it was just, it was a much different time. And, uh, so out of just sheer <laughs> dumb luck, I'd say more than anything, I was just around it early and into it early. And so I've, it's been fun to kind of watch it all kind of evolve. So you opened it in 2008? Yeah. And in, in your distinction, you said, is it is an American whiskey bar or just a... a it was really... Fo- so, you know, char number four, obviously. Sure. When you walked into this restaurant, the display behind the bar was only American whiskey. I had a chef from Texas, actually, sure. this guy, Matt Greco, who now has a restaurant in California. So we, you know, we weren't a barbecue restaurant, but we had a smoker and we were making our own sausages and making our own bacon. And right. it was really the... Fo- and my, my cocktail list was only... Um, American whiskey cocktails. There was no other cocktail on the menu. So I had vodka, gin, rum, tequila, like in the well. But when you walked into the restaurant, the only thing you could see was American whiskey. And then we had scotch, Japanese, Canadian, Irish, et cetera. Sure. All that stuff was in drawers behind the bar. So just as far as saying when you walked in, all you could see was American whiskey. Right, American. The only thing missing were guns on the wall. That was the only thing missing. Exactly. <laughs> and But what was interesting about that time, though, too, is I think in order to fill the shelves with American whiskey, I had to buy every single Everything. American whiskey on the market. Sure. Right? Whereas if you were to do that now and you say you had 160 slots, right, you'd be in editing mode. Which of the five or six maker down. SKUs am I going to carry? Which of the you know five or six Woodford SKUs am I going to carry? So, so all of the big guys have obviously expanded their um, offerings dramatically. Right, diversified. Plus all the craft stuff, plus all – folks like us who are sourcing from other people. And so that has just um, accelerated at such a rapid rate since then. So it's been, it's been fun to watch. It's been insane. Uh, I mean, even from the last few years of just being uh, in the Facebook world, just to watch people go from uh, the, the, the secret was well or 12, right? Like yep. you could go get it off the shelf. Yep. Then the secret was like OWA. And now I see people flipping Weller Special Reserve. Sure. And like it's the best thing they've ever tasted. I'm yeah. like, man, what what a time to, to see things evolve the way that they've evolved. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of – respectfully, I don't mean any offense yeah. to anyone specific. There's yeah. a lot of garbage out there. Sure. Uh, it's just, it's just amazing how it's become, it's like wine, right? You go to a, you go to any, you go to HEB. Yeah. How many different wines do they have on the, on the shelf? It's be, it's become a saturation issue. Yeah. And it's not slowing down anytime soon. I, no. I, American whiskey I is going to continue that. to saturate. It's got a long, a long way to go. A long way to go. 100%. Like vodkas, gins. So yeah. what made you decide to get into, to, I mean, Pinhook? What, what was the name come from? So this and, was, I mean, again, I'll try to, it is a long story. I'll try to give the short version. So, I was hanging out with two good friends of mine who are not in the industry in 2010. We'd had too much to drink, and we just said one of those dumb things you say when you've had too much to drink, like, you know what? We should have our own bourbon. So this is post. I've already opened char number four. So was the goal bourbon or was it goal rye? Because it seems like the rye is killing it right now. It was bourbon initially. So, But what happened was, so MGP, who we've sourced from since the beginning of Penhook, back when it was actually LDI. Right, it was Lawrenceburg Distillers, and then it was purchased by MGP. So when we started buying from them, it was still LDI. And I think now in the industry, obviously for people who know anything about the industry, MGP is this well-known thing. Sure. Right. Yeah. Back then, it's, it it's was, kind of like Berlin yeah. 101 now. I yeah. mean, everyone kind of learned. Yeah, First thing you learn is about sourcing. Yeah. Know, right. So no one knew about sourcing back then, or those who did were not. It wasn't to the extent that it is now, yeah, right? For sure. So the average person, even if you were looking at, you know, KBD, right? The average person wasn't aware that Rowan's Creek, Noah's Mill, sure. Willet, Johnny Drum, and so on and so forth were all sourced. For that matter, Bullet. Sure. Right? I don't think Bullet Rye was even sourcing. Bullet Rye didn't even exist back then. I don't sure. off the top of my head, I don't know the first year that Bullet Rye came out, but my recollection was that when we bought our first barrels from MGP or LDI, which were bourbon, there was no um, there was no bullet rye. So that, that's at least my recollection, right? right? But anyway, you didn't have as many big guys. High West had gotten started. I think High West got started in like 07, I want to say. Um, but again, it was that whole thing. No one was really aware of it. Right. So it actually, interestingly, because it sounds, you know, if you think about it now, it wouldn't be a hard thing. It took me a really long time to find LDI. 
right? So first I started by talking to Drew at Willet and I was like, hey, any chance you can get me some barrels? He's like, I don't do that anymore, right? Yeah. Black Maple Hill. And I think he started with Michter's and all this other stuff. He's like, I don't do that anymore. So I was just kind of off running around and it's like, it would be a funny thing to say I found LDI, like this giant massive distillery that people who are in the industry already knew about it, already knew about. But from my standpoint, I'm a restaurant owner, right? Sommelier, now bourbon, whatever, geek, nerd, just I'm into it, but I'd never heard of it before, right? So, but of course, once you find them, you can just pick up the phone and say, what you got? Right. You know? Order from a menu. Order from a menu. Now, at the time, and this is part of what made it easy, we paid $465 per barrel for three-year-old bourbon. That's awesome. Okay. So, we bought 40 barrels. Right. Not, uh, I'm not, I'm not, it's not all, to be flipped, but it's not a lot of money, you sure. know, in the scheme of life to drop 17 grand to, and, and our thought was like, Hey, we'll drink it. We'll give it to our friends. I can run it through the restaurant. Like it just didn't seem like this massive, right. like, especially yeah. what it is now. What it, yeah, it's crazy. Um, but the other thing about it was we didn't, because this was so early on. So we bought the barrels in 2011, we didn't really see an opportunity. We were doing it for the love of bourbon. We wanted to see the barrels age. We just wanted to taste them. All these things we took at face value. Whoa, how different are the barrels from each other? What do they taste like as they age? You know, how different is four-year-old bourbon from three-year-old bourbon and so right. on and so forth. So we shipped our barrels from, um, from Indiana to Bardstown, Kentucky. This guy, Strong Spirits, Michael Canbar, he created the original Redemption um, rye and sure. bourbon, right? Yeah. And the green, you know, the They're taller, now with the uh, taller bottle. Deutsch family, yeah. Yeah, they got bought out and changed the bottle shape and all that. Um, and also, interestingly, he was the only person I could find who had a facility. To that, store barrels. To store, be able to do the blending, the bottling, and then if ultimately, you know, sell to a distributor. So, took a while to find him. We shipped the barrels and we spent three years just going to Kentucky maybe five, six times a year, checking in on our barrels, visiting other distilleries, and just hanging out. It was really about, like I said, understanding the aging, just the curiosity of that. Sure. And then also wanting to spend more time in Kentucky. And of course. You know, yeah, we go like three or four yeah. times a year. Um, so one of my friends that I bought the barrels with, his best friend from high school is in thoroughbred horse racing. He grew up in the business. And so we would stay at his house. And he just started showing us the lay of the land. We we're staying in Lexington. And so we're going to Keeneland, going to Churchill Downs, watching horses train, you know, going to horse sales, going to horse farms. And we're just soaking in, you know, the Kentucky magic, bourbon and horses. It's the most quintessential, maybe you'd even say cliched thing, but most it's American thing. The most I think American the word thing, you're looking right? for, yeah. Most, so, and we're having a blast doing it. I mean, it's it's pretty fun. Have you been to Keeneland? Uh, no, no, yeah. I have not. Well, to, uh, we should go. To, to hang out at this beautiful track on a sunny day, drink some whiskey, make little $2 bets on horses and go down to the paddock and watch them go. Around. It's just, it's, yeah, it's fun, right? Um, so we started looking at it and we're having a lot of fun with it. And meanwhile, because of my wine background, I was like, should we be doing like aging in wine barrels? Like I was trying to think of right. what our – Your niche like, would be. Yeah, what our niche would be. But again – finished bourbons weren't all the rage back then. Either. Those weren't the rage either. Yeah. So I was like, hey, I know a lot of people in the wine business. Maybe I can get some cool barrels from here and there. Um, and, you know, we just kept thinking about it. And again, we weren't really in a hurry and we weren't thinking about building a brand. Right. That wasn't really the goal. The goal was like, eventually we'll put this stuff in a bottle and then whatever happens, happens. So, but then we really started looking at it and we were kind of blown away that, you know, Woodford is the sponsor of the Derby, right? Corporate sponsorship. And they do that special bottle once a year, but thing, it's like, yeah. but it's like same him. bottle, same juice. They put a different label on it, right? Blanton's has a horse on top, no connection to thoroughbred horse racing. Makers does their commemorative <laughs> Derby bottling, Rock Hill Farms. The, the full wax dipping yeah. of it, yeah. But so everybody has all of these um, – there are all these associations, but we weren't seeing like a true connection. So Jamie, our friend in the horse business, does a couple things in the business. One is called pin hooking. So pin hook is when you buy a baby horse based on its lineage to sell it for a profit when it's mature so someone else can race it. So you take on the early risk and then they take on this other risk of actually racing the horse, which is very expensive and often doesn't – you know, go very well. House flipping. House flipping. Horse, sorry, horse flipping. Yeah, horse flipping. <laughs> so we connected the dots that we were pin hooking bourbon. 
Sure. We were buying baby Berman. And because I had seen all the the people come through and it, I, I, there's no point even mentioning names, but all the people we know were, you know, bullshitting about where they got their stuff and pretending like they had distilleries when they didn't. It also made sense to me that we were being um, upfront in even in the name, right? Right. You're just being upfront in the name that like we're not – we don't make it. We find it. We sure. buy it based on its lineage and then we flip What's it. What Stolen does, Stolen – this is stolen whiskey. This is stolen. Being rum. honest yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, so Jamie also has a racing stable called Bourbon Lane Stable. And he names every horse in his stable with bourbon in the name of the horse. He was already doing that. So, you know, for us, it was kind of this easy like ding, ding, ding. And we were like, wait a minute, Jamie, what if we do, you know, one release of bourbon a year and each release is connected to whichever horse in your stable you think has the best chance of making it to the Derby. So it's a horse at the beginning of its oh, it's racing career. Oh, it's got a great career. story, yeah. So you can actually follow the career of the horse. So really the idea was for it to be experiential, meaning I'm not assuming that most people do this, but if you wanted to, you could kind of go on our journey, right? You could like go to our website, see the races the horse has been in, where it finished, when it's racing next. You could go online and bet on the horse. It's tremendously show up at fun. The, it's a fun idea. That's that, what we were trying to yeah. capture was the fun that we were having. And we were like, not to, not to again, be cliche, but it was like, can we kind of bottle this fun that we're having in Kentucky around these two quintessential things and do it in a way that tra- where that fun translates to the people that are buying the bottles. And that was, that was really You're, where it yeah. started. You had mentioned that you guys actually have an app that you can do now? Yeah, so we have an app. Um, we're working on it for Android, which is will be ready soon, but we have one on the iPhone store. And basically what it does is it when you hold um, – when you launch the app, it pops your camera open and it can recognize the horse based on the drawing. Wow. And then it kicks out detailed info. information on it. Yeah, and you can see the there's a picture of the actual horse. It explains and actually shows a drawing of how horses are measured in hands. Turn it around kind of to stuff. the to the camera? People can see it. That's almost like a QR code reader, but based off the specific drawing. And did, did I? Did, where'd you get the drawings from? Because I think you had mentioned. Yeah. So this, and um, that's actually another thing that's on the app too. It talks about our um, the artist who does it. Her name is Noli Novak, and she does all of the. For anyone who's looked at the Wall Street Journal, that's her work, right? So she's been trained to do this. Is all done with a pen by hand. Wow. And so she does each drawing, and we try to as you can see between the two rides, kind of change up the style of the way she does them so that – and we change the geometry, which is all based on jockey silks. And, you know, so then the idea is that if you had both rides next to each other from one vintage well, – I mean, we'll get into the vintage stuff, but – What's the uh, so what's the <clears throat> name and, like, the, the color? Is it is there a C sex now in the world? Are we adding that to the – What's that? To the list of sexes. Oh. So, like, what's the – Oh, so cult. What, yeah, what's, like, the, the, the size, color, sex stuff? Um, so that you have, um, so you can have a Colt or a Philly. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they just have, you know, you have a Bay, uh, a Roan. So you have different colors, okay. um, and so on that they use to basically describe. <laughs> and what are the thoughts style. behind the proof? Cause it looks like you got a variation here between 93 and a half to 97. Yeah. So that's probably one of my favorite aspects of what we do, which really came from my own I'm not saying I discovered it, but it was just for my own palate, my own discovery, which was that, you know, the, when I, we've, we've done eight releases of pinhook bourbon. The first seven were ages six to nine and a half. And we were basically, we did seven releases. So each one was basically six months apart. Sure. And so the first one release we did was a horse called bourbon courage and it was proofed at 90. The reason I proofed it at 90 was I tasted uh, the bourbon at maybe, let's say, 14, 16 different proofs. And I thought 90 proof was the most balanced. And then because of the way the bourbon industry typically works, I just assumed that 90 was our proof. So then the subsequent six were all bottled at 90 proof. What I realized going back, you know, once we'd gotten to the end of it, um, those first seven, when I would go back and I would taste through all of them, what I realized was not so much that I had favorites like this is better than that. I felt like, at least to my palate, more objectively, I'd say, this one seems hot. This one has a short finish. This one is more balanced. So I felt like the I, what I should have been doing was proofing each one of them uniquely just based – not just on the age, but based on where those That is exactly what you should were, have been doing. <laughs> right? That is a great a mindset to have. A lot of people – and I've said this before. I think part of the reason why the industry was so slow for so long is it was very cookie cutter. It was very boring. There was no innovation. Like you said, there was – a lot of brands had one skew. 
just right. one SKU. And for those, I, I, I'm sure everybody listening knows what a SKU is, but yeah. essentially one barcode, right? You've yeah. got one product. Uh, and now, and one of the first things I, I saw added as brands started branching out of their comfort zone was a rye, right? Yep. Um, bullet rye. Yeah. Right. You bullet bourbon, classic, you made this massive impact. And then, uh, first thing they did was add a rye. Correct. Uh, I brought old Forrester's rye today. Yeah. Uh, there, there's just, there's been a ton of, um, branching out of that comfort zone. But I, I like the idea, proofing to what you felt was best for that specific spirit. And that is, what I think, you know, a lot of brands should have been doing for a long time, but I'm seeing that more and more. Every time I get someone in here, they're talking about uh, how they proof to that specific spirit. It's fantastic. And that led to, and it really, where we had started originally, even though I hadn't, at least for us, figured out the proofing thing, was each one was a different age. So we had built in from the start this idea that no two pinhooks were meant to be the same, right? It's And which I think that sure. speaks to my something that made sense to me from a wine standpoint was the idea of vintages. Also, when, where I was looking at it, and this is at, not at all a knock on the big guys who do an amazing job producing delicious, consistent product. But from a wine perspective, if you look at people in the wine business who try to obliterate vintage, right, they basically try to blend wine so that you can't tell them apart. You're looking at all the mass producers of wine. If you look at any producer that's serious, the whole point is that each vintage is meant to be different because the fruit is different. And so they just make the best expression of wine that they can with the fruit that they have. So my way of thinking about it from a vintage standpoint was, okay, let's look at it. So if we do 150 barrels total production for a rye, I just want it to taste the best it possibly can. And so if that means that the proof is moving, so be it. I'm just going to try to get it to hit the sweet spot. And so these two bottles we have right here are a great example of it. Um, the first one that we tasted, which says lot one, um, which is bourbon and rye is the name of the horse is 93.5 proof. And the barrels are a blend of two to two and a half year old barrels, but most of them are around two years old. The next release where, as you can see now, it says fall 2018. We wanted to reinforce the, um, we wanted to reinforce the vintage idea. And so we actually put a date on it, this one. So basically the same fill dates as that one, a year older. So this is all North of three years old. And I thought 97 proof was the sweet spot. And so what I'm doing is tasting them from 80 to barrel strength at 16 different proofs, trying to find, and again, this is where I think about it more the way I always thought about wine is I'm looking for balance, complexity, length of finish, right? Those, those to me are the kind of, you know, on a- Your focus. Those your, are my main focus. Your three broad, pillars, yeah. Those are the pillars. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> and so I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep you know, nar I narrow down where I think the proof seems best. We'll taste it half a degree on either side. And I just find what, again, this is to my palate. I'm trying to find where I think it's the most balanced, harmonious expression of those particular barrels. And then it will never exist again, which is kind of fun to me in a way. And that's what makes wine fun too, right? Is the idea that I hope somewhere not to, I don't say this to flatter myself, but I hope that somewhere someone's like, you know what, this is the first rye pin hook ever made. I'm going to make sure I keep some of that around. It's going to be fun to taste as they keep coming out with different ryes over time and have, have it as a reference point. Right. I think the Japanese call it wabi-sabi, that, uh, and, and that embrace of what's fleeting in life, the the you know the enjoying the imperfections yeah. of life, and the fact that once that's gone, that's that's gone. That's yeah. what's beautiful about it. And and I've always said that about going back to the wine thing. The whole idea of vintages being special is because you're getting little. And I know Jack, our producer, he, he doesn't drink, but you're getting little time capsules, little pieces of of this is a moment in time that you're tasting in that bottle from this specific decade or or, or year. And I, it's one of the things that I absolutely love about this hobby is you're getting little, yeah, little taste treats, little little moments in time. I love that. And uh, I uh, think so, too, it's when so you, prophetic. When you talk to Two wine, in. I feel like when you talk to winemakers too, they'll always talk about they somehow remember the harder vintages, you know, because you know because there's such a pain in the ass. It was yeah, yeah. but then they're ha then they got something that From they it. were happy at with. They're not going to say, you know, for them. I think when you say, oh, well, it was the most perfectly ripe, you know beautiful fruit and so of course i was able to make a delicious wine it was the the time when they were had to struggle um and then it but it also like you were saying it places it in time in an interesting way like i hope for me that i'll always i mean of course i'll always have a bottle around but when i taste that even more so it's one thing if it's a year and a half from when we first bottled it but when it's five years from now i think we'll always just have like a 
a place in my memory of like sure. remembering that. So, yeah, God, I remember yeah. when we first bottled this. This was the first thing, you know. To be, you know, we're. I'm sure we'll get to this part too. But we're um, we're now based out of the Castle and Key Distillery. You know, the former. Old I was going to get to that. We'll get to that um, for sure. But, but anyway, this was the first thing to be bottled there. No, to be clear, this is not. Again, I was being very clear about this. This is MGP product, but this was the first bottle bottled by Castle and Key to come out of there since, you know, the distillery was shut down in 72, was abandoned in the mid 80s. And for many people who'd run around Kentucky and hop the fence and had seen this place, you know, in, in shambles, in shambles, yeah. it was friends of ours that bought it and brought it back to life. And this was the first thing that came. So I still have the memory of like being there and they were still like, you know, yeah. trying to figure out how the label machine worked. And, you know, it's like, yeah. it has those kind of trying to get the cool, yeast off the, yeah, yeah Marianne yeah. Barnes, um, or it's yeah, Eves Marianne, now. Marianne Eves. Yeah. yeah. Marianne Eves. She, uh, I remember when I first, the whole, my, my whiskey journey started on Instagram. I was focused on doing a little cartoon character and a little whiskey Pete guy. And, and she was right when she first took over, uh, before she was this massive whiskey celebrity. Uh, we used to actually, I used to message her like, Hey, when do you guys open? Like, I'd love to get, you know, do a whiskey Pete with you. And. Uh, and, and now she's like this massive superstar. She's been in all these movies and, or all these whiskey documentaries. And, um, but we've got another superstar here today and I actually want to get into, uh, the tasting because what we're doing today is a, uh, me and Daryl. Daryl is the host of Bad Wine Reviews on YouTube. We're going to taste through some pinhook samples. You guys are doing a, rolling out your first single barrel program. Correct. And we will get the first for the state for this show. Yes, yeah, that is so, 100% correct. So in your face, <laughs> uh, those listening, um, and I mean that with, with the most humble respect, um, I'm more humble than anyone listening, and we will be tasting through three samples yeah. of, what, 115-ish? Yeah, proof? that's my best guess. Yeah? Yeah, 115 So about proof. over 110 proof, yep. r- r- single barrel rye. Single barrel rye. And do you have the preset label design like how does that work what, what are these what are these going to look like are they gonna have green wax they have so rye gets its own uh, single barrel rye gets its own wax color so it's this really cool blue with a so it's the same you'll see this horse on it um so it's connected to rye humor so it's connected to whichever is the current release sure so it has the diamond so it's it looks exactly like this but blue and blue, blue. diamonds and, blue. and then it gets a top label done we'll deal have your guys name on can it. it say will it family estate on <laughs> is that allowed i have no idea <laughs> so daryl you haven't said much Talk, talk to us about your show. Like, what? what how did you get started in this? Because I've actually your your videos have been absolutely hilarious, and I, I'm excited to. Ha- I've been on one of your videos, which I need to talk to you about because I'm not real proud of that video. Um, I was exhausted. I I worked a double, did a show here, then drove to Boss Cat. It was like this this crazy long day. But you're you're what made you get started on these? I mean, why bad wine reviews? Because you do a lot of uh, cognac. I've seen Armagnac recently. Lots of whiskey. Uh, why bad wine reviews? So it started out as a, uh, we were going to do mo- all satire. So what we were going to do is only drink really, really high-end stuff. Well, your first episode's and wine in a can. Exactly. Right. So it, it started out as, an, again, uh, too much to drink. Yeah. Um, so start Great out. Great ideas are born from this. Yes, That's so right. It is. You just have, is. To, you have to follow through. Exactly. And uh, so we started out with just completely satire and wanted to review like really high-end stuff, but just really not, like just make fun and not understand it. Um, but then I got to think, I'm like, well... I really enjoy stuff and like I, I really enjoy nice whiskeys, but also enjoy trash beer. And so let's just do it all. And so it just kind of started with that. And I was in the grocery store and I picked up some uh, canned wine and I was like, let's review it. And then, you know, I think co- you did some Franzia that episode. Too. I did some Franzia. Yep. Yep. And I, uh, I sneak someone in my wife's class when after she's had a couple. Sure. I'm tired of her opening. My what eyes vintage stuff. of Franzia was that? I think that was the uh, red. The red vintage. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, but no, man, it's been fun. And, and you know, I've, I've learned a heck of a lot. I've, I've met uh, a ton of really, really cool people. Um, and, uh, you know, it. I think when it first started, I didn't realize that there's all these people that I didn't realize a lot of people did this. And yeah. so I didn't know that. And so I, you know, I was like, oh, you're just trying to get free samples of stuff. I didn't know people did that. So I didn't know it was possible. Yeah, I did. uh, And now I understand the, um, the hate 
and the oh, you, get a, you get a ton of hate. <laughs> yeah, 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 a ton of hate and um, a lot of uh, just, well, just it, anger. even someone as accomplished as Fred Minnick. You know, Fred. Yeah, Fred's uh, a, a multi-author, right? He's he's uh, he, he's a he's editor in chief over at Bourbon Plus. Big fan of the magazine. Uh, he was a whiskey advocate for a long time. He's a journalist, and it's like if you're in if you're tied to the industry but you don't produce anything. You're the bastard child. Oh yeah. And I've seen Fred catch a lot of heat. I'm like, he's a legitimate author and you know, the Ascot thing's funny and everyone even he even he'll poke fun at it sometimes. But he started doing his own channel on YouTube reviewing stuff and you know, I never realized how absolutely savage his opinions can be sometimes. Just cold blooded, just rip apart free samples. I mean, that's the downside if you're sending someone free samples. Be be prepared to get the feedback. That's right. I'm honest. Like I, you know, I there's been a couple of videos that I couldn't post because it I, it was pure vinegar and just terrible stuff. So well, I, I'm gonna listen. I, I'm someone that's easily pleased. Like I have a very diverse palate, and not that that's not to say that I have a great palate. That's simply to say that I enjoy many things. Like you said, even trash beer. I had a Miller Lite the other day that was ice cold. I haven't oh, had amazing. a Miller, I haven't had a Miller Lite in, in ten years. It's great beer. And it was Super Bowl. And I was like, oh my God, I forgot how great Miller Lite was. Ice cold in a bottle. It's amazing. Uh it, it was amazing. So yeah. my, my my point is is that um I get people I talk to that do this that they won't write anything if they don't like it. And I'm like, no, you should give your feedback. And brands I think for a long, even now, a lot of times brands get their feelings hurt and it's not, you can, I see it, Jack, you, you can, you can give, oh, we're running out of time for this segment. You can give constructive feedback and do it in a way that once you get established as giving constructive feedback, then people will go into it knowing that that's possible. But until you get established, don't say anything mean. Otherwise you'll, you'll get blackballed as, you know, it's yeah. this weird thing that happens. I, I appreciate the negative feedback and I've, listen, I had, I love Haitian rum. I had some Claren in here a couple episodes back that smelled like ham and, and olives and I wanted to throw up in, on camera and I, and I love Haitian rum, but it was just freaking disgusting. So, um, I, listen, I, I, I applaud the the mentality. I think I I encourage it. I think you sh you should. And your videos are funny enough that, although you've given some some thumbs down on a few things, several, yeah. several, a lot of my writing, uh, several writing ones where it's just don't buy this. I yeah. think well, I won't say the name, but anyway, yeah. I actually saw your article that you did uh, where you were tying spirits to the type of gun owner. Uh, what what gun you should pair with your alcohol? Yes. Right, right. Yes. And you were like, you know, <laughs> yes. a, a beer is this type of gun, mm -hmm. and, and then he was like, he was like, for you gin drinkers, <laughs> you don't have a gun. <laughs> like just like, <laughs> and I, I actually we've reviewed gin on here a few times. I'm actually developing a, a great appreciation for gin as the original flavored vodka, but uh, it's uh, I've enjoyed your your stuff. So Appreciate I figured it. you'd be a perfect fit to come up here today and taste through these with me and. We can pick out the first pin hook uh, and first single barrel for the show. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, man. Well, let's jump into it. You want to talk us through them one by one? Sure. Um, so I think these are, um, I think these will be fun to taste. Um, those are monster samples. Just I don't know how many meals? people are going to be. These are 200 ounces. Yeah. Um, they were all filled um, in the same week. Um, so October 20th through 28th of 2015. Okay. They all, um, are of course MGP. Um, they, I guess at this point would have had about two years at the castle and key Rick house, which for people who haven't visited, um, the original ware warehouse that Colonel Taylor built is the longest Rick house in America. It's almost two football fields long. Um, all three of these lived on the third floor. Um, how many barrels is going to hold? 32,000, I think. Wow. 30,000 barrels. Um, and, but there, each one was in a different wreck. I get, uh, off the top of my head. I don't know like which is which, sure. but they come from three different wrecks. And then I think there are 13 spots in each wreck. You know, I mean, they stack up a little bit from the aisle being like P1 to the window being P13, and they're from a few different positions. So I think it's a, I think it, besides the fact that I don't think there are any dogs in, in the bunch, um, I think it's pretty interesting. <clears throat> You'll see how different they are from each other. 
given and, the fact that they were all filled at the same time, made in the same place, aged in the same place, aged on the same floor. And, did, and, and who decided these three samples? I did. Right. So what you go through and you pick a lot, uh, meaning not – a bunch, but an actual lot of barrels. Yeah, I'm, taste through them all. Yeah, and I, so yeah, so I'm basically pre-approving them, and they're obviously you're not the Joe all, Beatrice of, yeah, of um, exactly Pinhook. exactly. They're they're not all created equal, of course, but uh, I'd like to think if one makes it past, it means that one one thing that we're doing, and obviously we're not the only ones doing it, is we bottle at cast strength. So our single barrel program is called True Single Barrel. The reason we call it True Single Barrel is for two primary reasons. One I'm not trying to pick barrels, nor do I want other people to pick barrels that are like each other. So we're trying to celebrate the uniqueness, which to me is kind of the point of single barrels. And two, we bottle at cast strength. So what you taste is what you get. So straight from the no, barrel. Straight from the barrel. Um, they don't do any chill filtering, uh, but they will be charcoal filtered. Um, <laughs> I see a little um, – is that a little – Remnants in the bottom of the bottle. Yeah, well, these wouldn't have been. Uh, these would have been thieved from the barrel, so there would be no oh, filtering. No. Yeah. Yeah. So but can yeah, I see yeah, it? So, yeah. How, can I pay extra for you not to filter it? That's a good question. I, I want, don't see I, any I, reason. I mean, do do leave the char in there. Uh, yeah, I know. In, in years, that's not a problem. In years past, we had a. Um, uh, there was a brand I liked out of North Carolina for a brief moment called Defiance. They made an American single malt, yep. and they they had a problem where. A few, for some reason, a batch of bottles that made it to Texas had floaties, right? Little, some char, mm-hmm. some, some barrel remnants, or some cork remnants. Who knows? But but it was enough that at that point in time, enough retailers and of course the average consumer thought it was a bad thing, so they would reject it, send it yep. back to the distributor, and then it's a it's a costly endeavor. Yep, that's no longer the case. Right. No one will reject this. Right. I want. I I'm want. Filtered. Have you ever had uh, uh, black? Uh, Black Adder, they do a, yeah. uh, they do raw, straight raw cask. So you literally, it's got like a spoonful of actual barrel char. And when you grab the bottle, it's literally like a snow globe of barrel char floating yeah. around. I mean, awesome. big fat chunks of tea leaves floating around in there. And uh, I, I love it. Yeah. So definitely want it as, like you said, a true single barrel. Um, and I guess we'll, I guess we can jump into this. Yeah, go for it. So which, uh, which bottle do you have there? Fifteen seventy eight. Uh, fifteen five twenty. What are we looking at? Well, you have uh, right there. Oh, so fifteen seventy eight. Yeah, yeah. All right. I give my guest of honor the first pour. Appreciate that. Very kind of you. Walk us through your relationship with Castle and Key while we get this ready. Yeah, so it's actually. Um, I guess we've been really fortunate because it's just all been about friendship. So as I had said, it was uh, one of my close friends, whose best friend Jamie Hill is the guy that introduced us to the world of horses. And it's one of Jamie's best friends, um, Will Arvin, sure. who was the guy who – Did you want some of this? Yeah, I'll give it a taste, please. Thank you. Um, was the guy who um, first got a wild hair. And I'm sure – you know, look, anyone who – certainly Will lives in Lexington. And anybody who lives in um, in the area, I think, at some point has had passed by um, – the old Taylor Distillery. It's quite a sight for anyone who hasn't seen it. You know, Colonel Taylor oh, it's, built it's, a castle, <laughs> and all of a sudden it just appears on the side of a windy, you know, kind of country road. And uh, so many a person has pulled their car over to the side and 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 hopped the fence um, to check it out. Um, so Will was the one who actually, um, you know, took it to the next level, bought it um, along with uh, Wes Murray. It was kind of the other founding partner, and uh, they set about um, restoring it. And actually, it was kind of amazing because I, I had a meeting. Jamie and I met with Will and Wes in the very early going, and it was just a bunch of guys in hazmat suits doing asbestos abatement. At this point, they didn't have um, – there was no Marianne. or the, I mean, they were still at the very, very beginning. Um, I'd like to say we like took some big leap of faith, but the reality was they said – they knew that they needed contracts, right, in order f- for their business model to work, that they knew from the start that they were going to make whiskey for other people. We knew that ultimately it would be great to have more of a hand in um, in the process and to be able to see it from, you know, from zero. Um, and so, yeah, we were, um, you know, I, I 
I guess I'd say don't quote me on it unless I'm missing something. But as far as I know, we were the first people there. We were the first people to say, like, we can't wait for you guys to find a, a master distiller and um, get, you know, get this thing up and running. And it was a, a five-year process. And I got to sit down with Marianne and create a custom mash bill for Pinhook for both bourbon and rye. Uh, they're nothing like So these. it's contract distilling, not so much. Well, we're – I mean, it's – I see it as more of a partnership, right? Because we don't have our own master distiller. I'm not a master distiller. We rely on their team to do all the distilling, but I got to sit down and pick different mash bills and different yeasts and different combinations of mash bills and yeast to ultimately arrive at what I liked the most for Penhook. And the fun thing about what Castle and Key is doing that's different is it's not just they have three or four recipes and then you get your choice. I got to pick my own. Um, I got to pick my own recipe, which is, uh, proprietary to us. No one else who's sourcing from there can have our exact thing. So now we will truly have a unique, um, a unique bourbon and rye. So, so historically, um, you guys were sourcing from MGP Yes, and now you're still sourcing, but also contract distilling and aging with Castle. Yeah. So we have, so we have some barrels, um, actually if I can, uh, not not Speak so freely, much no a, not so much a promo, but um, so we have some we have a, a decent number of barrels left from MGP. We have no plans to purchase any more barrels from MGP. Um, I came up with an idea, which is around some of the things we've been talking about, which is going to start this fall, which is called our vertical series. Which again, harkening back to wine. So the idea is, it's basically my chance to have a do over on the original pen hook. So we are going to do. This fall, a there's, there's going to be a four-year-old pinhook bourbon, MGP, and we have enough to do it. I, at least in theory, we'll see how it all shakes out to do it until it's 12 years old, and I'll change the proof every year. That's a lot of barrels. So people can follow. Well, but we'll do the release. That's a great idea. Limited. Yeah. So um, as far as I know, it has not been done. Well, it's definitely not been done. I think I would have seen it if it had. So the idea is that you can follow – the barrels that were every filled year within different a couple proofs. months of each other and follow them from age four to age 12. That's awesome. And we'll do the same with rye as well. So these will be limited releases and there's the annual release. And I, I just think it's going to be kind of fun to, for people to see something they never really get to see, which is almost like the behind the scenes of how all the decisions are being made. We're just saying, here it is at four, here it is at five, here it is at six. Well, that commits everyone to buying two bottles, no matter what, one to drink and one to save. And do a vertical. I'd like to of- think there's some good marketing involved too, but I'm I'm first and foremost I'm excited about just the, that the, the nerd aspect of yes, it. Yeah, it's going to be fun. That, that, that's what, how you can tell that someone really enjoys this hobby is you guys uh, you you kind of get excited about the the coolness of this. I remember even to this day, my favorite aspect of of this hobby is is samples, not samples sent to me, but when. When you do a sample for a barrel pick and you take a sample bottle with you, you know, you go to, um, sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Russell's reserve or yeah. wild Turkey. And we picked out a barrel. Eddie, uh, let me fill a Dasani bottle with, you know, with, a- with, with bourbon. <laughs> and, and then that's I just, awesome. I get to take it home. And then that's my, that's my Eddie Russell reserve private bottle thing that I just put it up on. The, so I've got all these little mini bottles and mini things that I just had available at the time that, we could fill of the barrels we did. Same thing at Jack Daniels. You go to you pick out a Jack Daniels bottle or barrel, they'll give you a sample bottle to take with you. So you can kind of taste it uh, against when it finally gets bottled and, and brought to you. Sometimes it takes seven months before something gets to you. And seven months can spend some time in the barrel and be a little different and proof may change. And it's it's this this experimenting nerd out thing that, that you get to do and it's a lot of fun. And coming across <clears throat> barrels like this. I'll tell you this. Um, I like the idea of what we're going to do. So typically with barrel picking, I like to taste through all the samples, give my my point reviews yeah. and rates, yeah. and then discuss. Yeah. But we're doing it a little differently because we have a show. Yeah. But while we taste, yeah. you talking while we can not talk yeah. and drink is, is, is fantastic. Okay, perfect. So, um, I'll tell you right now, my first thought on this, yeah. and it's not a bad thought. Yeah, yeah. Not a bad thought. My yeah. first nose reminded me in a good way, which typically any other – Time I'm saying this is in a very very bad way. Yeah. Uh, uh, mint, mentholated dip. The nose reminded me of of dip yeah. tobacco, kind of a, a rich minty. I would and and I'm hearkening back to picking up my uncle's Dr Pepper bottle one time and it. 
but in a good way. Like it wasn't unappealing. It just it, I, it was a reminiscent of something. I would take that as a compliment. It was it was different. I'll tell you right now. I think the bump in proof. Uh, these are these are great. I, listen, I've liked the brand at these proofs, but there just seems to be a whole lot more mouthfeel at that one fifteen. Oh yeah, that's nice. The the oh for sure. Everything about that was just, just a little bit more present, and uh, I really. What did you think? The nose. Give your honest opi- opinions. Oh, I, will. I don't the, know this guy, so you can just. <laughs> I've never seen him again. No, the uh, for me the nose on this one. That's the winner on on this particular one. Like I, um, I must. I got more of a like marshmallow, but not the not the toasted marshmallow that everyone wants to talk about. I got like just pure marshmallow and like more of like a citrusy melon, like a, a calmer fruit. So like I, a, I didn't a melon. Get, I didn't get melon. I got marshmallow all day. Kind of like yeah. a not toasted, but kind of like a. Doesn't mar- isn't there like a whip you can buy that's like not the formed marshmallows? Yeah, you've got it's like, like it's like the peanut butter and jelly whip now. Yeah, 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 but they got marshmallow. Yeah, marshmallow, marshmallow fluff. 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 Yeah, that's one F. This, yeah. yeah, we used to have fluffernutter yeah. sandwiches at camp. Yeah, no, it. Uh, so I got that, but um, yeah, the nose for this one, I, I enjoyed the nose. To me, the 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 mouth feel was incredible. To me, the 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 flavor, the taste, just it kind of was fleeting a little bit. Sure. So, but to me, the nose was. Incredible, and I've said I, this I really before. The nose. I'm a bit of a, uh, I have a nose bias. Like uh, if something smells fantastic, I have a hard time not l- loving it unless the finish has just gone awful. And there's a lingering finish. Yeah, I, the finish I, was good. I, I'm, I'm still tasting it in my mouth. I'm a little numb actually from the bump and proof. But I also think, to me, to your point, I, at least in my mind, when I do these, I will, and I guess we'll see if it holds true. But I would reject anyone for not having a good nose because I think in my mind. For it to be worthy of a selection, it has to be complete. And so you definitely come across some good ones when you're running through all the barrels that um, don't have much of a nose and then they deliver on the palate. But yeah. I think um, unless it's doing both, um, it's not really working. So at least – and again, it's everyone's palate is different. But I'm certainly – like if, if it doesn't have a good nose and for, for the same reason that you said as well, which is that it influences a lot about how you taste, then I would – mostly i'd say reject them for yeah. not having a good nose well i'll say this and we have to take a, our break again i mean this is flying by fa- so fast but um there was a pick that was done locally that was very well received overall but the nose on it was just garbage and i yeah. could i was kind of surprised to see so many people speak highly of this pick and i think it in my opinion i think a lot of times it has to do with uh when you get into a, the realm of barrel selections there's a legacy involved with any kind of name tied to a pick, right? So the uh, the Bourbon Mafia, if they've got a string sure. of famous picks, or 1792, if they've got a – not 1792, uh, 1789B, which is a barrel picking group out of Kentucky that's been doing this longer than most, or, or T5C, these groups have uh, cult status tied to their picks. Yeah. So – they're, they're, people are a little bit more lenient on their picks because of who they are. Sure. And I, I, I've seen that, at, at, and, and vice versa. I've known people that dismissed picks because of a name tied to it, um, which is why uh, we've seen a few kind of mystery picks lately in the group. I really dig super, super unique noses. I mean, everyone's – look, my one complaint with American whiskey, bourbon in particular, has to do with – the narrowness of the palate, right? Scotch, you can get yeah. sherry barrels, you can get peated whiskey, yes. you can get the, the the palate, meaning the artist's palate, P-A-L-L-E-T-T-E, that is uh, so much more diverse than than with bourbon. Bourbon is a very narrow range of flavors, caramel or whatever. Yeah. Um, sorry, that was my phone. Well, I think to your point, that that's what kind of led led us on our path in a way was I think the more I learned about bourbon, the more I was, you know – understanding what you're saying, which is the narrowness of the the production laws basically means that inherently, even though each distiller is going to say they have their own mash bill and they have their own way of doing things, their own yeast, their own, all their own methods, it's such a narrow category that it's basically set up for things to be more similar than dissimilar in, in the world of bourbon and rye. That, that's what I was saying. So it, if you taste something that has something that's, that's, a, it's a, it's this perimeter flavor that's, yeah. that's not usually tied to bourbon yeah. that unique yeah not to bring up skull dip yeah. again but that uniqueness is so uncommon yeah. that i kind of now nav- i kind of want to grab yeah. it you know me too and I, I think that's what led us so it's interesting when we released our first rye 
we had a lot of people say, I don't normally like rye like this rye. It's much more floral. It's softer, all these other kinds of things. And I think part of the reason for that was when I was doing the, when I was doing the proofing, I didn't feel the responsibility that I think more traditional distilleries do, which is to adhere to some sort of notion of what rye is supposed to taste like. You know, I think it's, they're trying to think about it in terms of hitting certain notes um, and kind of checking these boxes in terms of what it should be like. And so what I find really fun is we have the freedom to basically say, if, if I encounter somewhere in the proofing a point where it's showing something really unique, like apricot or stone fruit or you know, and any sort of interesting, unique flavors like you're talking about, sure. we can basically bottle that because we're not beholden to um, putting out something that tastes the same all the time. And I feel like within what is already a narrow category, that was kind of my thought about, and this was one thing we did think about when we started, what can we do that's different? These big guys have already proven that they're quite adept at putting out delicious, delicious distillate and making it taste the same or quite pretty damn similar over and over and over again. And so my thought was kind of like, well, we certainly can't do that as well as them. And in the best case scenario, we could do it as well as them. Sure. So what else could we do? And that's where we came to the idea of each one being a unique representation of those barrels just at a moment in time of vintage. And, well, and that's been really the kind of the thing that's been exciting to me. I think it's a little short-sighted or it, or it shows the short-sightedness of some of these big guys uh, where if you go in for a barrel pick, those barrels are pre-selected just like you. You kind mm -hmm. of They kind of taste a bunch that they want to set aside for the barrel program. But if that barrel, they'll taste it after you pick it. If it's too different from their core profile, yeah. they won't let you keep the barrel. Correct. And that's something Buffalo Trace does. You go up there, you pick an OWA, Old Weller Antique. If it's too off profile, Nah, sorry. We're, we're gonna we'll let you come back and pick another one. And that goes back to the our I hate quote that. unquote, and which actually it does say it on our single barrels. It says true single barrel. It's that idea, which is we don't have a profile. We have their picks. Pick whatever you want. We don't care. We have different. We have a, we have a whole stable of flavors. We have a ah! stable of flavors. Was, you had to go for it, Lou. I'm out of here. You just I'm knock out. everything off. I'm done. God damn it. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you my thoughts on this. Yeah. Like Daryl first. So this one, the uh, I got more of like a sweeter, yep. like a, a creamier nose on I wrote, this one. I wrote that down. I also wrote um, down the word safe. I feel like this is a safe pick. Everyone will love it. it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's it, to me that the number one so far, that's that's the dangerous pick, right? Like the right. nose. That's the, the nose, wild card. That's the, 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 the Daryl Bowman the, of the pick. Nose one blows nose two away. But overall, like I think. If you take it all, maybe the average is better for two. Um, I, don't know, I wrote down it. It tastes like a beautiful lawn looks, right? Like if you see like a beautiful landscape lawn, it's like that's what it kind of tastes like. like sure. You, it just kind of ex – it tastes like I how I would expect a really nice sure a rye would taste. So I don't know. I, not I've had two. I wrote down pretty much um, – uh, a, not above average, but but really really good, but really safe. Like there's nothing crazy going on. Yeah, the absolutely. nose, the, there's nothing offensive about the nose. There's nothing right. offensive about the palate. There's nothing offensive about uh, uh, the finish. It is just a sweet rye. Mm -hmm. It's 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 safe. It's a nice. It's the it's the. It's the Courtney Cox of uh, <laughs> of rye picks. <laughs> Monica was safe. Rachel was dangerous. That was That's the okay. whole. That okay. was the whole yeah, yeah. reference. I'm in. I'm in so Seinfeld reference for those listening. One um, thing I would say too, which is not at all about you know my own personal favorites, but is just what I like in all of these because it's not a given. I can tell you from tasting through a lot is that the alcohol integration is really nice. Yeah, right. I mean, well, they're they're right. They're hot in the sense that they're probably 115 proof, but. The way they hit you, I can tell you, you can taste stuff at much different. lower proof where it comes across as hotter. Sure. And so that's one thing that I'm looking for in the single barrels as well, irrespective of the different notes and flavors, is like it, it should be able to stand on its own at cast strength. I assume that people who like whiskey will play around with it and add a drop of water and add a cube and do whatever they're going to do. But I like the idea that if you taste it neat, that the alcohol – is nicely integrated, which again doesn't mean that it's not powerful. Sixteen oh six is definitely the most well, I would say the most balanced. Like you balanced. said, the most average. Uh, not not again, not not to say average is in boring, but it is the most balanced. Everything from the nose 
to the palate to the finish has all got the same similar sweetness and this melding love fest going on mm-hmm. of just whereas the first one is like crazy yeah. on the nose, uh, really big bold mouth feel. I mean, it just it's it's a matter of preference at that point. Right. I'm excited to taste the next one, and we have seven minutes. All right, let's do, let's do it. Uh, so fifteen. It's that one you got in your hands. Eighty-eight, right? Yeah. Sixteen oh six was the one we just did. Yep. Here you go. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You always hate. Uh, like whenever I taste caramel, I don't ever want to write that down in my review as a note because it's, because it's, <laughs> it's the most common. It's like, well, it's caramel and you know, uh, creme brulee. I'm like, well, yeah, it's bourbon. So caramel and creme brulee is the same thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's the it's, most common note, but that's because it's the most common flavor. The, right. Going back to the right. variety of flavors you get in American whiskey, it's usually pretty um, tighter shot group compared to some other spirits. Which is why I'm kind of, to be honest, not to talk tra- trash about whiskey, but yeah. to see a sommelier go from wine into the whiskey world is is kind of unique because most sommeliers I know uh, may have dabbled in whiskey that may have ignited their passion, but have branched on to wine because it's such a more diverse experience. It's it's and it's a more minute experience, right? Like those little differences in in reds from year to year is so much more focused than. Uh, 130 proof whatever you know i think that one thing which has not i wouldn't say it's changed dramatically but it has changed since i first started getting into it part of the appeal on bourbon was its kind of humble origins and the lack of snobbery around it because again you have to understand that it didn't exist are you in hbs (laughs) (laughs) no but no but that's the point though right in 2008 there, there was no trophy hunting there, there were no, um, there no, were no bourbon unicorns. No one was chasing any of the stuff, um, and so I was kind of thought it was fun that, like, yeah, here's, uh, here's, I, I can't, I mean, I'll get this close, but like, I think vintage twenty three three year rye was probably like a forty five dollar wholesale price. That's crazy, right? So the, all these things that were represented, and one thing that I thought was difficult about wine, the more I got into it, is. You know, I worked at some very nice restaurants and we opened all the crazy stuff. But these are, you know, two, three, four, five thousand dollar bottles of wine that the average person is never going to be able to taste. And I thought it was kind of, you know, first growth Bordeaux in the 70s, while not cheap, was something that some anyone who just made like a decent living, they could afford to buy a case of Lafitte Rothschild, right? It was expensive, right? But it wasn't like I could never get it. And now, unfortunately, you know, I mean, yeah, you can go to a bar and drop 100, 150 bucks to taste pappy or, you know, if, if you're of means. But it's starting to get to the point where bourbon isn't quite reaching the same level of wine, but where – Definitely heading in that direction. It's – certain things are just out of out of reach. Um, but that was not the case back then and that was actually part of the appeal. What do you think of this one? <clears throat> so the nose, I got uh, like kind of Granny Smith apple. And like floral, yeah, more fruity. On, on, yeah, um, wasn't wild about the flavor. I don't know. It was a little, um, it was a little more sour than than the nose let on for me. I don't know. I, I felt the. I'm a little different. I felt the nose was a little, um, not unimpressive, but I enjoyed the mouthfeel. It was a lot more bolder in the mouth. It wasn't. It, it, I can tell you now that three is definitely probably my least of the favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, the finish was a little bit shorter, a little bit more harsher. But, again, just that, that little bump and proof, there's, it packs so much more. Uh, there's a lot of flavor in all three of those bottles. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoyed all three. I didn't hate any of them. Mm-hmm. There was nothing crazy no. offensive about it. The nose on three was just a little I, – I don't even remember it. And that was 30 seconds ago. You yeah. Know what I mean, a little forgetful. It was the Jack Brain of uh, of of rye noses. That's my producer. It's kind of it's to me that nose is on the one hand it's noticeable because it does kind of jump out of the glass, but it's also just kind of sweet and not. There's not a lot of complexity to the nose, but it is. I like it for um, what you were saying. It it is kind of bright and fruity, so that that part is nice about it. But l- l- let me go back to one. I want to I want to revisit yeah, one. I think after. that would be. F- I, I love revisiting one. After having two, one is starting to intrigue me more. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, I think coming back after 
these three. I think we can definitely rule out three. Yeah, yeah, I think I so. Ju I just kind of put the the nose and finish on the lacking in and a, and a pretty decent palate. Again, all of these are very viscous. I can tell you that. They've okay. got all a, a crazy amount of mouthfeel and oil and really, uh, really enjoy them. So where do you put mouthfeel on, like, when you rate something overall? I put it high up. Me too. I think it's like an... What would you, what, same what would you in rank wine. them in? I mean... Nose first? Yeah, I would go nose first just because... If the nose isn't there, then there's nowhere to like. It's kind of hard. It's the it's the first impression kind right. of thing, which is a lot of value. It's like going into a restaurant and there's a rude hostess. It's uh, our host at that point. You don't know her gender. Don't assume it. Yeah. 2019. Um, 2019. 2019. Okay, with the program. <laughs> um, but it's hard to get past that, right? I mean, if someone's rude sure. to you, and then first impressions that, mean everything. First impressions yeah. mean everything, and so to me, that's the nose. It's kind of that first thing. It's the same way that even though people want to say it's all about what's in the bottle, packaging matters too, right? You see a oh, bottle yeah. and it makes you feel like you want to like it and the nose is after the package the next the next thing that is really going to make an impression on you. But um, a cigar with this would be pretty oh outstanding. My God. Do you smoke cigars? Oh, absolutely. I think it would be amazing. Um, but I think mouth feels huge after – after um, and again, like I was saying in wine, I think it's kind of a, also – a, a, undervalued underrated aspect of it is just <laughs> the way it sits on your palate the weight of it how creamy it is the, the just the overall texture um is wonder, really part of the drinking experience there's a there's a two-year-old rye on the market i won't say which brand uh that's peerless what, that's a, well <laughs> uh, can i confirm <laughs> or deny okay. can i confirm just, or deny just gonna throw that uh, out there that, that, anyone talks about that i think though. is a really great 60 dollar bottle except it's oh. usually a 120 dollar bottle yeah yeah it's a great uh, bottle. and this is older and this mouthfeel is this it coats everything. Yeah. You really don't get like any melon on that. I get that. Like just on the initial nose, I get it. I'm not I'm not sticking to melon. I'm sticking yeah. to, to to tobacco. Yeah. And uh I'll tell you, I've been recently fascinated with tobacco because of our recent Four Roses pick. Mm. Uh there's something just it's crazy when you take something, put it in wood. No yeah. additives, yep. and then it yields something that tastes like nothing that was put in the barrel. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you get tobacco or melons or floor. You're like, I didn't put melons in the barrel, but it tastes like that. If I can just quickly, I guess we're running out of time. I was going to digress quickly though and say, interestingly, pin hooking originally came from the tobacco industry. So it was about people picking a youthful crop before it was fully developed in advance of it being fully developed, staking their claim to it, hopefully um, that it was buying good it by on the time. futures. And paying less for it and then selling it for a profit. And then wow. that term came into the horse business. Well, I think that sounds like kismet to me. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> Sticking to two? Let me go back to two real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Can we taste two again? Is it, Be honest. What do you find unappealing about one? Because you two. seem unsure. Here you go. There we go. I don't – I. <laughs> After having th after having three, I don't find anything unappealing about one. I think that the to me the only thing that I, I thought was kind of weird is like the the flavor, the the finish was long, but the flavor seemed to fleet. To fleet. Does that make sense? So there was nothing gross about the way it tasted. Right. Just short. Yeah, but then the mouthfeel, the mouthfeel just continued on. Yeah, the so, finish is is I'm getting a lot of the finish, but not. I'm not getting what you mean when you you talking about the finish seems short. No, that, I think, yeah, maybe. I'm just yeah. trying to understand you. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to understand me too. Um, it's okay. I'll try to find ourselves. To me, yeah. So maybe the maybe the finish the maybe the finish was flinger, uh, fleeting, but it, to me the flavor just kind of seemed to disappear. But oh, but that nose just keeps pulling me back on one. So so two is a sugar bomb. I'm getting yeah. It's just a, it's just a brown a, sugar. Just a yeah. Uh, I think that's going to be highly appealing. I don't mean this as an insult. I hope people don't watch this and take this as an insult. It's going to be highly appealing to the the average drinker. Sure. The safe drinker, the one that says, I'm a Makers fan, a Wild Turkey fan, that's all I drink, or that's all my father drank. Right. I think one is a bit of a wild card. It's the it's the Gene Beck of the the yeah yeah you know what i mean yeah absolutely it's 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 a crazy wild card guy but you lo it's lovable like there's something about that nose of just like yeah we talk about this all the time with barrel picks though which you know and i think you guys have the luxury of not having to worry about this but 
if you were a store and you were picking an entire barrel for your clientele, there's a tendency, like you have that outlier barrel, like one, right. Which is something that, I mean, I don't even think that it's like such a, it's, it's to me, it's not super weird, but it's definitely very unique and it's not typical. And so you're kind of deciding like, well, do I want to pick something like that? Or can I pick something great like two, right? Which is down the middle in a way. But it's still, I, I like that a lot. I mean, I think it's a great barrel. Okay. But it's so, more down the middle. But do you, so which way do you go? Do you, do you celebrate the kind of uniqueness and almost, I don't, I don't know if weirdness is too strong a word, or do you go for something that is like more accessible to more palates? Like, okay. what's the point? Okay. So in, in life, I have my own political beliefs, but I don't share them online because obviously I'm not stupid anymore. I used to. <laughs> don't play it safe. Yeah. And I know that this is your brand and yeah. your baby. Yeah. Which of the three did you like more? Can I be totally honest? Yeah. I, so I tasted through 50 barrels of rye, and the first one was my favorite of all the barrels I tasted. So my palate. And I put it in here. I wanted to give you guys the opportunity to taste what I thought was my favorite barrel. You're not just but again, kissing my ass, are you? No. No, it's a hundred percent. I I could I show you my little. Radio, I right? could show you my notepad. It has three smiley faces, and, as opposed to the others that had two smiley. So I picked Just fifteen. Get, you look so sad. I picked. No. I picked fifteen. I picked fifteen rye barrels out of fifty that I tasted. Uh, all fifteen that I picked, I think, are worthy of being a single barrel. Five of the fifteen I had special notes on as being barrels that I thought stood above the other ten. And of the remaining five. This can I, is can my I have favorite. two barrels? <laughs> of, what? of? Uh, oh, can you pick two? Yeah, I can, I can do one through specs. <laughs> and then that way you take care of your big box store here in Texas. Um, oh, you're talking about well, I know one that for, and two? Well, I'll tell you what. Two reminds me, just just to put it out there, yeah. reminds me a little bit of Angel's Envy Rye. It's a dessert. And yeah, that it, sweetness. It's a, it's a, it's yeah. a digestive. Yes. It's after dinner. Yes. You could taste <clears throat> this and it's just a sweet, sugary bomb. I'll take one and two if you'll give it to right. me. And uh, and I know that the reason why these are so limited is you've got to make everybody happy. I can do it through any store you want. So right. total wine, yeah, uh, we'll take it. Specs, we'll take it. We could talk about it off air. You would take both. We'll I, talk I, about I, it off yeah, air. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can but tell I think, you. But I think this one. What's fun to me about this, and this is goes back to what we were talking about. That's originally. one. Yeah, yeah. This is one. I would hope that someone would have that bottle, and it would be one of those bottles that they would try to make last a really long time. Sure. And like someone comes over who's like a close friend and they're like, oh, I'm going to give you a little taste from my special bottle. And again, I think all the single barrels are meant to be great in and of themselves. But this is kind of the point in a way to me is that you're going to have these outliers. <laughs> and that is the point of single barrel picks in the first place, which I think has been... Oh, these are completely different. Yeah, they're totally oh, sure. different. Yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I think, and not to, this isn't about me getting on my soapbox, but I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit. I don't understand the idea of a distillery or someone like me, NDP, whatever you want to, from wherever it's coming from, basically saying we want to pick these barrels for conformity's sake. So basically we want to identify all really good single barrels that all more or less taste like each other. That defeats the whole purpose to me, of I imagine the way that single barrels came about was the master distiller, master taster, whatever, some employee going through and like coming across a barrel and putting a big mark on it and saying, no, no one else can touch this. This is for me and my friends, yeah. right? Because it's something different and something cool. And and I don't think a down the middle barrel, no matter how good it is, represents that. Like I don't think this is down the middle at all. I think it, it is dessert Which were you talking bottle. about, two? Two is a dessert in a bottle. No, it's not down the middle, right? Yeah. Because it's great. Yeah, yeah, I, I really, right. I really like to. Uh, it, like I said, it's it's a perfect. There's a guy that's been on the show twice, Evans, who is uh, he's got a passion for barbecue. Yeah, those those burnt burnt bacon ends or whatever they're called, burnt what are they called? Burn ends. Burn ends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this guy is notorious for sugar, right? So I've seen him make these amazing um, <clears throat> uh, bourbon balls. Yeah. Just uh, out of this world. He's got a sweet tooth like I do. Yeah. And I know he'll love too. Yeah. One, I think, will appeal to many, many people who like bold um, or smoke cigars or like really uh, – I mentioned Blind Pig before on the show. The Blind Pig up north wanted uh, – I heard wanted to do a maker's barrel that was mostly mocha. So it's like a really – so it's great with a cigar. It's a, yeah. it's a cigar blend yeah. for the thing. So it, it that's – where my mind is with both of these. It's not a matter of one's better than the other. It's yeah. like they're completely different and I right. don't know who to choose. It's a blonde or a brunette. 
I like one. I like one. I think I've gravitated back to one. And the reason is, is that if you're going, I view picks differently, I guess. Like I want, when I grab a pick, I don't want it to taste like what I can get on the shelf. And to me, one has that different, it just has that overall different taste. Two is a higher proof, sweeter version of what's on the shelf. One is a complete different beast. Right. That's my opinion. So uh, we'll definitely take one. I'm yep. going to try to talk to you about two. We'll talk about that. And uh, we'll go from there. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for Thank having me. Thank you very much. Nice great to meet you. you.